Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage director of the Ronald Reagan Institute, Mr. Roger Zakheim. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Nothing like some paid help to start the applause. I appreciate it. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today at the Ronald Reagan Institute, which, as those in the room know, uh, carries on the legacy of our nation's 40th president here in Washington, D.C. As was mentioned, I'm Roger Zakheim, director of the Institute, and we are excited to host this event as part of our Center for Peace Through Strength's National Security Innovation-Based Program in collaboration with Congressman Brad Wenstrup and the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence for their really consequential series, Beyond the Skiff. And for those who are not aware of this series, what it means is you get to interact with the members of Congress that never see sunlight <laughs> outside our nation's capital. Not that there's much sunlight today, but it's in Reagan country, it's always sunny, and so we'll bring some in this discussion. Now, the Reagan Institute's NSIB program, as we refer to it, is dedicated to assessing the health and effectiveness of America's national security innovation ecosystem. Now, much of our work focuses on unlocking potential of emerging technologies and capabilities like artificial intelligence, which, as you all know, brings enormous promise for progress across all of our national security endeavors. And I'll shamelessly self-promote here. Outside, we have our national security innovation base report card, which actually tries to harness and understand how the United States is doing in terms of realizing where we need to be as a country when it comes to the NSIB. But more relevant to today, just as innovation is creating new opportunities to benefit our national security, it is also creating vulnerabilities. And the domain of biosecurity is no exception. The democratization of emerging technologies like AI has only made it easier for our competitors and adversaries to engineer lethal new pathogens to wreak havoc on biosecurity. Scientists have already demonstrated how large language models can be tasked to develop cookbooks for novel agents, lowering the barrier of entry for malign actors without significant and sophisticated bioengineering expertise. So today's panel of experts bring deep experience across the public and private sectors at the nexus of biosecurity and technology. And led by my friend, Congressman Brad Wenstrup, this panel will analyze the horizon of emerging threats, assess the state of our biosecurity, and make policy recommendations that will help safeguard our national security and the health of the American people. But first, a few words from the chairman of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, Congressman Mike Turner. Please pay attention to the screen behind me. Good morning, everyone. I'm sorry I cannot be with you all in person today, but I want to start by thanking the, the Ronald Reagan Institute and Dr. Brad Wenstrup for hosting this crucial conversation. We are kicking off the eighth installment of the Beyond the Skiff series in the 118th Congress with Dr. Winstrup's panel, Biosecurity and the Weaponization of Artificial Intelligence. Before we get into this discussion, I would like to share some background on this series. At the beginning of 2023, the Intelligence Committee was tasked by former Speaker Kevin McCarthy to restore the House Intelligence Committee's focus on national security. We are committed to revitalize the committee's oversight of the intelligence community. As part of our strategy, we opened our committee to experts and leaders in national security and in the intelligence field to better counter the threats that are facing our nation. And it was this component of our approach that resulted in our establishing this Beyond the Skiff series. These discussions are important in making certain that the House Intelligence Committee is instrumental in any intelligence or national security conversations. It allows for our members to receive feedback and new information from individuals and organizations on what reforms and legislation House Intelligence Republicans should be focused on. For the first installment of 2024, Dr. Brad Winstrup has assembled an excellent panel to discuss biosecurity and the weaponization of artificial intelligence in partnership with the Ronald Reagan Institute. Dr. Winstrup represents Ohio's second congressional district. He brings experience as a doctor, an Army Reserve officer, and a veteran. Dr. Winstrup is the chairman of the Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic. His experience and background are vital in our ability to focus on biodefense and national health security. 
Americans, government officials, and our allies experienced a sense of urgency for further work on this critical issue following the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic. This timely discussion will bring to light the risks that we can face and how we can combat those threats. And with that, I will turn it over to my good friend and fellow Ohioan, Dr. Winstrup, and today's panelists. Thank you. Introduction, and uh, it's much appreciated. And I appreciate all of you being here uh, as well. Uh, I thank him for making that appearance because it's his efforts to make the committee more engaged, more engaged with experts so that we can even have some level of expertise and not just be relying on others to come in and tell us things. We want to be engaged with the intelligence community firsthand, to be partners with the intelligence community. So as legislators, it's so important that we not only engage with the broader community to learn from them, but that we have the opportunity to inform the public about the work that we do on the Intelligence Committee. You know, on the Intelligence Committee, we, we not only represent the people of the United States of America, we represent the other members of Congress who not, uh, are not in the room with us, who don't always have access to the things that we know. And so it's a great opportunity for us to share even more. So I'd like to thank the Ronald Reagan Institute for hosting this event, being leaders on so many issues about national security, uh, they've been an outstanding resource for me in my time in Congress, for sure. And uh, that includes this topic today, which is uh, biodefense and artificial intelligence. In particular, the work the Reagan Institute is conducting through its national security innovation base will help fill some critical gaps in the U.S. national security innovation system. You know, uh, Congressman Turner gave you some of my background. And I've been on the Intelligence Committee for almost 10 years now, and the only physician on there for some time. And I was interested in bioweapons even before COVID. Uh, but when COVID hit, another doctor and I, we were in lockdown, right? So we're, he's not working as a doctor. We're just doing research. We want to know how to treat people. What's going on inside the body when they get COVID? What's working? What's not? There's no test. There's no definitive treatment. In that process, though, and this is around February of 20, we find an article from 2015 with one of our scientists, Ralph Barrick, and a Chinese scientist, Zheng Lishi, where they could create a new virus. I didn't know that technology existed. And that got us going on a lot of different directions as we looked into this. So with, with that background, the, the pandemic was really eye-opening because of what we were seeing in real time regarding our nation's preparedness for a biologic event or lack thereof. And so throughout my time in Congress, I've been focused on policies that support our national security and our national health security to assure that we have access to care, access to medications. These are some of the challenges that we face. In February 2023, the intelligence community noted in their annual threat assessment the global shortcomings in preparedness for, the pan for a pandemic. And we hope to, that we can see that it will inspire many adversaries to consider options related to biological weapon development. According to the same assessment, and I quote, new technologies in AI and biotechnology are proliferating faster than companies and government can shape norms, protect privacy, and prevent dangerous outcomes, end quote. These developments could enable novel biological weapons and could complicate efforts to detect, attribute, and, and, and actually assess the, th the threat to treat it. Uh, so ideally, we want to lead to accelerating detection, attribution, and treatment. So the discussion with today's experts timely, hopefully informative to those here in person and those watching virtually. So before we begin, I want to let everyone know that we will have a Q&A session following our moderated discussion. I'm very excited about the panelists that we have here today who will bring unique experiences, some from different angles, uh, to talk about. So I'd like to thank the panelists for joining us here today and uh, go ahead and introduce them. First, Mr. Hirsch uh, Jane. Mr. Jane is the Head of Public Health and Senior Vice President for Federal Affairs at Planetaire Technologies, where he oversees the deployment of Planetaire software at HHS, CDC, FDA, ASPR, NIH, and other public health partners. 
That's a pretty broad spread. Since 2020, he has led Planetair's work supporting the federal COVID-19 response and the expansion of COVID-19 specific investments to other key public health problems across disease surveillance, clinical research, and supply chain management. Mr. Jane is a published machine learning author, has previously held technology roles at Google, Jane Street, and within the Department of Defense and graduated from Harvard University with degrees in mathematics and computer science. Welcome. Dr. Michelle Rozo. Dr. Michelle Rozo is Vice President of Technical Capabilities at InQtel, a nonprofit strategic investor that accelerates the development and delivery of cutting edge technologies to enhance the national security of the United States. Dr. Rozo is also the Vice Chair of the National Security Commission on Emerging Biotechnologies, and that's the capacity with which she is here today. Previously, she was uh, Director of Technology and National Security at the U.S. National Security Council, where she advised the President and National Security Advisor on biotechnology and national security policy. Dr. Rozo is a molecular biologist by training and studied severe infectious diseases as a staff scientist with the Naval Medical Research Center in Fort Dictrick, Maryland. She holds a PhD in biology from the Cell Molecular Developmental Biology and Biophysics program at the Johns Hopkins University and a BA in biology from Northwestern University. Welcome. Senator Jim Talent. Senator Talent was a U.S. Senator from Missouri from 2002 to 2007, at which time he was a member of the Senate Armed Services and Energy and Natural Resources Committees. He was Vice Chair of the Bipartisan Commission on the Prevention of WMD Proliferation and Terrorism, which has concluded that unless action is taken, a biological attack within the United States is increasingly likely. Together with former Senator Bob Graham, chairman of the commission, he has criticized the federal government's readiness to deal with major public health crises. So have I, Senator. <laughs> uh, Mr. Kenneth Weinstein. Mr. Weinstein serves as the Undersecretary for Intelligence and Analysis at the Department of Homeland Security. He was confirmed by the United States Senate in June of 2022. The Office of Intelligence and Analysis, he's a member of, and the department liaison to the U.S. intelligence community. Dr. Uh, Mr. Weinstein serves as the chief intelligence officer for DHS and reports directly to the DHS secretary and director of national intelligence. Mr. Weinstein also previously served as a commissioner on the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense, as a member of the Public Interest Declassification Board, and in several other national security organizations. Mr. Weinstein previously spent over 20 years in law enforcement and national security positions. He was a federal prosecutor, acting United States Attorney, General Counsel of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and Homeland Security Advisor uh, with, George, with President George W. Bush. As you can see, this is quite an accomplished group here today. And so I think we're gonna have a very interesting time. And so uh, with that, uh, I think it's time for you to, to come on board. <laughs> I'm at that end. Yeah. All right. Well, um, why don't we start asking everybody just in 90 seconds or so, if you could, how would each of you characterize the threats we face when it comes to bioweapons and artificial intelligence? And what do you focus on when it comes to studying the issue? And uh, so I'll give you a chance to reintroduce yourself, put a face with the name, and uh, Go ahead and answer that as quickly as you can, then we'll get into more detail. Great. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for moderating. Thank you to the Reagan Institute for being here, for allowing us to be here. Um, I think as the introduction covered, Palantir is a software company. I am a technologist by trade, and where we really specialize is in helping federal agencies and all of our partners make better use of their data to drive decision making. We were born in the aftermath of 9-11, and so our roots are really in national security and in protecting intelligence, as are my personal roots. And then over the last two decades, we've seen how readily that approach of connecting the data in an organization to the analysts and the decision makers scales and can be widely applied. Um, over the last couple of years, we've gone from being the backbone of just the federal government response to COVID to really serving as a backbone across a number of other public health areas of interest, 
30 plus disease areas at CDC, research infrastructure across cancer and a number of other diseases, um, as well as really helping manage federal supply chain and visibility into medical countermeasures. And so where does that leave us today? In some ways, I think this is a nexus of the investments we've made in healthcare over the last five plus years, as well as the roots that we have in national security. Uh, I think you know any technology historically that can be engineered has been used in the it has been used with a tremendous amount of opportunity for investment and growth and accelerating real outcomes. But there's also real risk that comes with that. And so I think from a infrastructure and a technology and how we actually make use of the tools and the data that we have, the place we're really focused is on what a national biosecurity infrastructure looks like, what the domain of biointelligence looks like, and what the partnerships between the public and the private sector are going to need to be to make sure that we're secure. Thank you. Doctor? Sure. And thank you so much, Congressman, and thank you to the Ronald Reagan Institute for having us today. I am delighted to be here to share the work that we're currently undertaking at the National Security Commission on Emerging Biotechnology. I'll note we just released our interim report about two weeks ago. I encourage everyone to check it out at biotech.senate.gov. Um, I come to my role as vice chair of the commission, as the Congressman mentioned, as a molecular biologist by training. I studied stem cells in my graduate work and then infectious diseases um, in my postdoc and staff scientist role. And so with this lens, I can say that one of the threats that we are facing is the risk of being overmatched in the critical convergent area of AI and biotechnology by a strategic competitor. AI is revolutionizing biotechnology and the applications go far beyond the pharmaceutical domain which I think is, is the domain that most people think about first when they hear about biotechnology. But really these technologies can be applied to almost the whole breadth of our economy and change the way that we think about our agriculture, our energy sectors, our industrial production and means of manufacturing, and of course our defense um, and military applications. And our adversaries are keenly aware of the breadth of the potential here and are investing heavily across these domains. And losing ground at the critical intersection of AI and biotechnology to these adversaries and strategic competitors would risk ceding enormous geopolitical advantage and risk our economic and national security. So at the Commission for Emerging Biotechnology, we're examining these risks and identifying policy options to keep the United States at the forefront of this critical competition. Thank you. Senator? Thanks, Congressman. I, I'm too grateful to be here. It's brought back some memories for me. You know, I would sum up um, the, the, the threat or the implications of this. It's AI is another aspect of the technological domain that is bringing capabilities or, or, or bringing uh, asymmetric capabilities within the purview, in particular, I think, of non-state actors who think asymmetrically anyway. In other words, um, this technology enables the good guys to do a lot of really good things but it also enables the bad guys to do bad things. And we are vulnerable to that. The oceans no longer protect us. So my experience with this goes back to the late aughts when uh, Mitch McConnell and Harry Reid asked former Senator Bob Graham and me uh, to uh, co-chair a commission, which was recommended by the 9-11 Commission, on the dangers of proliferation of WMD to terrorists. And they wanted us to look at nuclear and bio. Well, through two iterations, we ended up doing two iterations of that commission, and, and Senator Graham and I became increasingly convinced that in this context, the bio threat was much greater. Because uh, if you're a, a non-state actor and you're looking to do real damage, well, it's easier to develop bio, it's easier to stockpile bio, it's easier to transport bio, and, and that enables you to reload, by the way. So in other words, you can hit more than once. There's a limited amount of fissile material. So, uh, so we began to focus our recommendations on how to control the proliferation of this technology. But we also realized uh, that controlling the technology was going to be very difficult and probably playing defense alone in that sense was not going to reduce the risk to an acceptable level. So then we began to look at how can we prepare so effectively for some kind of a bioattack or indeed a naturally occurring pandemic event, which we've had since then, uh, so as such an attack would not be a weapon of mass destruction. We respond so quickly and so well that it does damage. It's bad, uh, but it's not that big of a threat. And that led us to start a nonprofit and to do the first uh, ever st stem to stern analysis of America's pandemic 
uh, response system we produced a report in October of 2011. Actually, pretty proud of it, Bob and I were. I don't know that anybody has, has updated that. that. That would very much be worth doing. And then a, a number of years later, I co-chaired with Bob Work, uh, the Reagan Institute's National Security Innovation-Based Task Force. That, that's a continuing enterprise here at the Reagan Institute. We made recommendations. We're monitoring. We're updating. We're grading. We're doing all of that. And a lot of those issues overlap. Uh, because one of the constant challenges whenever you're trying to, to innovate effectively for national security is how the government can send a consistent demand signal and how it can align the way it operates with the incentives in the private tech community so that we get out of that community what we need to get. And that challenge uh, is across all domains of technology. So that's where my focus is now, and I'm looking forward to learning an awful lot about AI from the people around me who actually know something about it. Secretary. Okay, thanks very much. And um, thanks to the Institute for having, putting this on and for having me. Um, I've been asked to sort of give a general overview of sort of a lay down of the intelligence picture that this debate sort of resides within. Um, and I will warn you, I'm not going to be the AI expert, so don't look to me for that expertise. I'm looking to my right. <laughs> we'll look to your right. I was not a technologist. I was not a microbiologist. I spent my life running from the math and the hard sciences. So <laughs> they'll be the AI experts. Um, but also, um, you know, at DHS, I do the intelligence work, uh, or my folks do the intelligence work. We do have a lot of uh, people in operations really focusing on this issue. We have our science and technology group head by Dimitri uh, Kutsenov, and then we have um, Marianne Callahan and her people at the Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction who are zeroed in on this issue and working very hard on biotechnology and AI. Um, and we also have uh, Eric Heisen, who's our CIO, overseeing our AI task force, which is something that the, the Secretary stood up to ensure responsible use of AI within the department, but also um, looking at the threat that AI can pose. So we have others in the department who are uh, very expert in that area. But what I want to speak, uh, the, the, what I've been asked to speak on is the general intelligence picture colored by my experience on the um, Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense. And I sat on that commission um, with uh, Joe Lieberman and uh, Governor Ridge and others uh, for about seven, eight years. We learned at the knee of uh, Senator and, and Senator Graham um, and the work they did. And he means by that that they let us testify at one of the earlier meetings. <laughs> you testified. You testified very well and, and uh, inspirationally, actually. And um, I think it's just useful to point out as sort of a framing exercise that today and this session is really a follow-on to a series of alarms that have been sounded over the years. Um, Hart Rudman back in the, uh, the 1990s and then the 9-11 Commission uh, right after 9-11, and then the WMD Commission and the Graham Talent uh, Commission, and then the work that, that I've been involved in with the, the Bipartisan Commission. They've all said this is an, sort of a, an, an issue that hasn't gotten the attention that it needs. And, and it's real. I mean, we've seen the threat has manifest in a variety of ways. I mean, going back to the you know, Japanese developing and testing uh, biological warfare back in World War II, up through salmonella poisonings out in Oregon, you know, in the Rajne with the Rajneesh cult back in the in the 80s, Al Qaeda, uh, that we learned was trying to get together an anthrax operation prior to 9/11. We found the evidence of that after 9/11. The anthrax letters, the ricin letters, over the last uh, decade or two. So we've seen that um, manifest. And then, of course, uh, in terms of state-sponsored bioterrorism ter efforts, we know obviously. Soviet Union had a very elaborate program, um, and uh, South Africa and others had uh, bioweapon programs. Um, still now, the intelligence community assesses that the, Soviet, uh, the, the Russians and North Koreans have programs. Uh, there are concerns about compliance under the convention, the bioweapons convention, on the part of Iran and China. Uh, so these, the concerns about bioattacks and bioweapons by regular actors for terrorist organizations or individuals and by state actors is very real. And that, of course, is only exacerbated by the advent of technology like AI that make it, A, easier to, to uh, generate sort of complicated pathogens and then also that lowers the barrier to, to entry 
to people who might not have sophistication in education to then you know, make, uh, mm -hmm. make use of that technology uh, for malign reasons. So uh, if anything, today is a moment not only to resound the alarm from before and from the prior commissions, but sound it even louder. Thank you all. I think one of the things that uh, you just said you know, plays into uh, where we are today, which is there's been a series of alarms. And I don't know that we gave them all the attention uh, as a nation that, that we should have throughout that time. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, emerging biotechnologies, they've changed the capabilities uh, and the threat landscape for sure in the last five, ten years uh, very noticeably. Uh, so let's, let's get into uh, questions here. Uh, COVID-19 dramatically exposed failures and weaknesses in the U.S. and the international community's biodefense capabilities. So it's not just the United States, it was across the globe. Uh, and furthermore, we've seen time and time again how adversaries, namely People's Republic of China, they'll alter, shape, shake, pu shape public information and opinion to protect their own interests in this space. And I think that's been a problem for the world, for the WHO, uh, and, and everyone watching this. So how has the Chinese Communist Party action toward and reaction to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, impacted our biodefense strategy, including the prospects of future bioweapons deployments? Who wants to start? <laughs> Go ahead, Senator. Um, okay, so I did eight years on the China Commission, and we, we produce a 550-page report every year about China. And when I saw on the news that they, and this just this is my opinion, not necessarily the Reagan Institute, when I saw that they had a level four bio lab in Wuhan, I turned to my wife and I said, I bet good American money that's where the COVID came from. Because I know the Chinese, the, the PRC's approach to life science. They want to dominate the field. They put immense pressure on their researchers to come up with discoveries. They don't share the same ethical constraints we share. Safety is not as big an issue for them. And all of that means a lab leak, which is a danger anyway throughout this whole field. Anybody who works with these pathogens knows it's, it's, it's difficult to handle them. Um, made that more likely. Now, I don't know whether that's true. That's what I think. I'm not as concerned, particularly with regard to China, about them uh, creating a bioweapon as a, as a deliberate strategy. It's very risky for them. Uh, it's difficult to control, although I understand you can try and structure these pathogens so that you can target one particular set of people, particularly if you have enough data. I understand that. But they have a bunch of other tools that are working pretty well for them now. So I'm much more concerned about, as far as they're concerned, about the size of the Navy and the nukes and their techno-national toolbox and the wolf warrior diplomacy uh, and the economic leverage and the rest of it. But, but having said that, I think the lesson of, of COVID is that we can't count on them to cooperate in pandemic response mm -hmm. unless they believe it's in, the, in, it's in their national interest and the objectives, the other objectives that Beijing has. And also, and we know this also, we did a chapter on this in the commission several years ago, they have a deliberate strategy to penetrate international institutions uh, and subvert them to the ends of uh, the Chinese state. And they have had some success in doing it. And so I think going forward, our attitude, and that includes the WHO, unfortunately needs to be trust but verify. In other words, exactly. yes, we have to keep working with them. We should. They have many good scientists. There's a lot of good partnerships. Uh, but we have to watch it. And I think going forward, that's probably uh, the, the, the most important, one of the more important lessons I get from the COVID response relating to Beijing in particular. And to your last point about trust but verify, uh, we spoke with Dr. Fauci last week and we talked about the U.S. funding research in China, not necessarily to four, but BSL-2, uh, and asking what kind of oversight do you have on the lab? And he said, I wouldn't know how to do that. Yeah. So. 
it's, okay. it's difficult. It, it, there's a whole other set of issues involved which you all are struggling with, which okay. is we can't de-link entirely without, you know, without cutting off our, you know, we'd be cutting off our, our nose to spite our faces. Okay. So how do we conduct this relationship going forward? And that applies to a, a broad range of policy areas. Yeah, if I can add, one area that I am worried about uh, with respect to the PRC is the strategic competition we're in for emerging technologies like biotechnologies. Um, and so, you know, we, we recognize biotechnology has been a long, around for a long time, but with advances in engineering, uh, other tools like artificial intelligence and automation, we are, you know, at the cusp of what folks are calling a biorevolution. Um, and we haven't hit that yet. We're not yet at the chat GPT moment, if you will, for this technology. But it is coming, and we're on the upswing. And the race is on, right? And, and the race against China in particular. This is the backdrop of which our commission was created. Um, and China has stated that they intend to win out in the race for biotechnology and to use this technology for economic and military gain. Of course, we know that we are facing a competitor who has a stated policy of civil military fusion, which means that any knowledge, any technology that they gain on the civil and commercial side will be applied to military applications. And I mentioned before, you know, all of the potential benefits when we master this technology, right? Not just pharmaceuticals, but ag, industry, energy, um, our own, you know, defense capabilities and biodefense. And we can get into that later of how biotechnology and AI is really revolutionizing our ability to respond and prepare for pandemics. But of course, like all emerging technologies, these can be misused, right? They can be weaponized for, for, to create bioweapons. They can also be misused to create new types of military capabilities um, that differ from the way that you know, we might use them, differ from our norms and values. And so it's really important that we remain at the leading edge of these technologies. Uh, we have you know, two options. We can run faster or we can slow them down. And I think we've counted for a long time on being able to run faster. I don't think that remains an option for much longer. And so at the commission, we are looking at policy recommendations for legislators that align with you know, two buckets. One is uh, strengthening our biotech sector. And a strong biotech sector is a prepared biotech sector, prepared for you know, what threats may face us, whether that be a naturally occurring pandemic or one that is man-made. Um, we're also looking at what we're calling technology choke points. So these are critical areas of biotechnology that are both necessary and limited. And if we maintain a choke point over an adversary, that's a point of leverage. But if an adversary maintains a choke point over us, that could be used against us. So again, these are two areas that are under investigation at our commission right now, and we look forward to, to continuing the conversation, delivering recommendations to keep us at the leading edge. Thank you. If, if I could. I want to set you up here a little bit because it was mentioned, and I think you might be one to comment on uh, non-state actors in this realm. And so if you care to comment on both of those situations. Sure, thanks. Uh, first, I want to hammer down on the point that both of you made about uh, the concern that uh, there would be Chinese efforts to steal our technology in the biotech space. No question. And um, look, as a policy matter, it's important that we manage the relationship with China. We have to have interaction with them. There's, there are benefits to the world and to them and to us to having exchanges, um, professional and academic exchanges, but we need to be clear right about this. And for you know, 20 years or so, we've seen a pattern of, on the part of the PRC going very methodically, industry by industry, to try to steal the technology that we developed and put it to their own use. And we've seen it in all industries. Um, here we have a situation where biotech is now stated policy by the PRC as a pillar of their industrial policy and strategy going forward. Nothing more important to the PRC than developing that technology. Therefore, nothing that they are more motivated to steal than our technology in that area. So we need to be clear right about it. Um, I got us, we were just meeting yesterday with some Customs and Border Protection folks who were telling stories about um, finding uh, folks over here who are uh, acting as students in American institutions who are caught um, stealing technology and who had actually hidden the fact that they're affiliated with the PLA. Um, and that's the kind of thing that happens on a regular basis. So um, while we need those exchanges, we have to be careful. And we need to take the intelligence that you, we, we have and others in the intelligence community have and make sure that it's fused with 
security measures, cybersecurity measures out in the private sector that can prevent that kind of theft. Um, on the irregular actors, you, you make, uh, you know, you, you raise the, the thing that you know, keeps a lot of us up at night, which is the prospect of terrorist groups or terrorists getting access to this kind of uh, technology. And obviously with AI and other technological advances, it's, it's easier now to conceive of an individual or a terrorist group actually weaponizing um, a bioweapon and, and actually unleashing uh, you know, a lot of um, death and destruction. And look, um, we saw that with Al-Qaeda, that they had plans to do it. We've, we've seen other terrorists who've tried to do it. Uh, it is worth putting in the current context of the post-October 7th environment. And October 7th unleashed a lot of passions, resentments, um, and biases uh, that um, you know, we've seen here in this country and around the world. And it also raises the prospect that we could get into crisis mode with some of our foreign adversaries to an extent that we haven't been for quite some time. And that just raises the prospects of people going, you know, being very aggressive in their efforts against us, and maybe against the Israelis. Um, and so uh, I think all the more important that in this environment, and it's not, gonna, it's not settling down anytime soon, no matter what actually happens militarily in Gaza, the, the heightened tension is going to remain with us for quite some time. It's all the more important that we make sure that WMD of all kind, uh, that we try to keep it out of the hands of malign actors. Can I just okay. add something? Sure. Um, I've always operated, and, and Senator Graham and I did, on the assumption that in the long run, it's probably easier to identify and control the bad guys than the bad technology. I don't know if that's still true. I know you all are working, and you mentioned the bottlenecks, mm -hmm. and there are leverage points, and it would be great if you can identify them and we could control them. The, the, only, the second point is uh, I hope that particularly the intel community that we don't overlook the simple threats. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if I, was, if I was out there a bad actor trying to decide how to hit the United States, yes, AI could teach me how to biologic or to d design a new pathogen. On the other hand, anthrax is all over the place. Easy to isolate, fairly easy to weaponize, easy to transport. And in fact, DHS did a, a model on anthrax like 10, 12 years ago in releasing it. So we, we'd have to stay after the bad guys uh, because there are ways, even if they don't use real sophisticated technology for them to hit us. Got it. Okay, so the most recent annual worldwide threat assessment published in February of this year mentioned that rapid advances in technology could lead to novel biological weapons, and the development of sub such weapons could complicate, obviously, detection, attribution, and treatment. Treatment is one thing I, I'd like to see us focus on mm -hmm. uh, as much as anything else. Um, but, you know, surveillance uh, varies. Uh, let's just talk about viruses in particular. Uh, surveillance of nature uh, is, is different from surveillance of lab work, uh, somewhere else especially, in a foreign lab, uh, or a Chinese-owned lab in California, uh, or, you know, a Russian lab in the middle of Siberia, perhaps. You know, so those are the things we have to worry about. So how can we... Uh, either on our own or working with our allies and partners especially, develop greater visibility into our adversaries' capabilities. Yeah, I can, I can take the first stab at that. And I think this actually ties to a lot of what we've been talking about as far as lessons we've learned post-COVID. I think one of the biggest lessons we learned and the things I was exposed about the way the government responds to, our government responds to man-made or natural threats is that the need for a whole of government response is something we have not really established our protocols for. We talk about the intel community, we talk about the State Department, we talk about the public health agencies, almost as if they cover different terrain and different turf on this overall problem, when the reality is that in the event of a crisis, we need really tight integration across those components, and we need the ability to move extremely rapidly. And I think this is where the potential upsides of technology are so high, because there is software, there is technology, that can allow these components to interact in a really first class way. And so what does that look like from a detection of threats and the ability to mitigate them? Well, we need, I'd say really a three-step process. One, 
high scale collection that is federally driven of data across all of these domains, whether it's biological data via wastewater surveillance, whether it's using naturally sort of, you know, appearing information in public, whether it's existing genomic sequencing and other things like that, we then need detection on top of that high scale collection that allows us to identify threats, whether man-made or foreign, whether anthrax, whether new variants of diseases. And then critically, we need response. And I think this is the other component that has been so lacking, which is once you identify a potential threat or a new variant, what does that actually trigger in our, in our either government systems or in our private sector? What kind of medical countermeasure development, what kind of policy guidance, what kind of research is immediately activated? And how can we tighten the feedback loops between the collection, the detection, and the response to be as rapid as possible? Because I think something we've learned is that the time to do that is not going to be on the scale of your years or even months. It is going to operate on the scale of days or hours for us to really mitigate these threats in a first class way. Um, and so I think, you know, that is where private sector, public sector, cross-agency approach has to come together for us to be able to really get ahead of any crisis, any biological threat, whether it is natural or man-made. And I think that approach really has to be a whole of government central to technology in that in you know being able to navigate these problems. I, I appreciate that in the whole of government and a couple of things, and anyone can comment on this, but we talk about, I, I mentioned the question like with our allies. So if we develop technology they, for early detection, pandemic went rapidly around the world. Mm -hmm. So the earlier something can be detected, it may be in Europe. And so we want our allies in Europe, I guess, to be able to have those technologies. I think that's what you're, you're saying. 100%. No, well. I think that's actually spot on. And I, it is a place we explicitly are not succeeding right now, where early, I mean, even using COVID still, the detection of variants right now across the world we are largely sharing with our allies and vice versa through the open internet. And that is not the level of sophistication we have in our intelligence sharing in the DOD or in the IC, right? We have 5i, we have real pro protocol, we have real doctrine around how our intelligence agencies can share threat information with one another. We don't have anything like that for biological threats or for biological data in the first place. And so investing in, you're exactly right, not just a whole of government, but across our allied nations, a real infrastructure that leverages the technology we have to share that information, detect threats, and be able to unilaterally make decisions across that ecosystem is, is absolutely critical. You mentioned public-private partnership. I wonder if anybody wants to talk about the advantages of that and where we can do better in that regard. I think, if we, I'm sorry. I think if, if we don't do that, <laughs> there's just no way to succeed. And yeah. This is not, this, this security enterprise is not like the Cold War where there was basically one buyer, the government, and basically the Department of Defense. And so over time, uh, a dozen or so prime contractors developed and they learned, because they had the one buyer, how to work through the procurement processes of the government and the DOD did not really have to adjust to them, they adjusted to the DOD. Well, all this research we need now is dual use an enormous part of the ecosystem is, is, and there's a lot of funding, that's good, is privately funded. Mm -hmm. And actors who I think would be perfectly willing to work with the government and would like to help with this enterprise, I mean, they're humane people, but their, their culture and their, their incentives within that part of the market is very different from the government. And so I think one of the things, this is one of the things I was gonna to recommend to you, if you, is to constantly work on, get, uh, the executive branch agencies know they need to do this but to get them to work on being innovative rather than incremental, that was a recommendation of the Lieberman Ridge panel, and to be willing to take risks. Mm -hmm. I testified uh, before um, Seth Moulton's committee or subcommittee a couple years ago, and I said I, the message to the bureaucrats ought to be, look, if everything you do is succeeding, you're not trying enough. Yeah. Because their attitude, and I can understand it, I've sat in these hearings, you sat in these hearings, we try something and it fails, they're gonna hang us up by the thumbs. Mm -hmm. And so I think the highest levels of political authority, to include the Congress, need to send the message, no, we don't want you to do anything foolish. And uh, th then I think if we send out the right signals, then, then the private sector will be incentivized to overcome the obstacles yeah. and deal with yeah. the government. I think that's exactly right. Doctor. Yeah, failing fast, right? Knowing how you're failing and then iterating on that. I think that's exactly right. Um, and I think there were some, they're good examples through the pandemic of translational investments, right? Not just basic research, not just R&D, but actually getting 
these products from lab to market um, in a way that wasn't possible before. We had things like mRNA technology that had been funded for decades, right, but were never really ready for prime time. And through these public-private partnerships, that technology became you know, mass-produced, reviewed, was determined to be safe and effective, and now researchers are looking at mRNA technology for treatments of entirely new things like cancer. That's really exciting. It's a good news story. Um, and it shows the power of these public-private partnerships that took risks, right, that, um, and then invested in translational work. And we're not going to know what we need before we need it, right? And so these, these relationships need to be there in advance. The, the companies need to um, understand how they fit into the ecosystem. And whether that's a vaccine for a pandemic that is coming or a supply chain shock that prevents our ability to source a critical chemical from China, biotech could be the solution to both of these problems. But right now, these companies are not oriented towards our defense supply chain. They don't understand necessarily how they fit, um, or they don't know the demand signals. Yeah. And so that, that's really important for the government to be able to communicate early, communicate often, um, and be able to create you know, that, those partnerships. And coordinate a clear, consistent, which means the more of these integrating apparatus you can create within the executive branch, like the bio steering committee mm -hmm. that we have now, or the National Biosurveillance Integration Center, where all the agencies, I mean, I think we're set, you and the executive branch are setting the architecture up, but the question is, is it working? Mm -hmm. I, would, I would even add that for truly innovative companies, particularly in technology, which is the world I come from, we've made it incredibly challenging to work with the government. Mm -hmm. The amount of regulation, the amount of process that is required to be in a place where you can actually land a government contract mm -hmm. is enormous. And I say this with the privilege of an organization that invested in this for 15 years before the majority of Silicon Valley did. And yeah. so us really widening the tent of how software companies and technology companies and biotechnology companies can interact with and sell to the government and not need to have invested in a 50-person organization that only navigates federal legislation or regulations and contracting law, but really working with you know, the government to make sure that that path is as easy as possible while still ensuring that all of the security and the regulation that needs to be upheld is upheld mm -hmm. is so important. I think we're thinking a lot about the investments we've made over the last 20 years to be able to sell our own software and what it looks like to broaden that to the private sector more broadly so that they can leverage the investments we've made in accreditations and in security to really be able to focus on building differentiated biotechnology and technology offerings and get those inside the government. We have found that that is like hopefully scalable and that there is a lot of opportunity there for the broader private sector and technology industry to be part of the way the government solves these problems. But I think it's more than just the orientation towards the defense. It's also about the incentives mm -hmm. for being able to generate, sort of being able to do well and do good all at once. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think um, Operation Warp Speed was an example of the government engaging with the private sector and uh, being able to do something quickly, but I also saw within our own communities, you know, from the medical side, you know, war, war is war, and that doesn't mean civilians are exempt. And in, with the pandemic, civilians obviously are not exempt. Everybody's engaged, and we saw communities now developing what would be a quick reaction force. Uh, we're going to set up hospital in the convention center. All these types of things that we should be engaging and promoting on a local level no matter what the, the problem may be. And I think that's, that's something that we should be promoting, too, is having our communities ready for something like that. Um, so I uh, want to get to some of the lessons learned, I guess. And uh, what should we be learning, or have we learned by now, from the COVID-19 pandemic regarding our approach to biosecurity and preparedness to address the broad range of biological threats we face? You know, you were talking about mRNA technology, mm -hmm. uh, you know what I heard early on as well. We sequence the virus and we make a cassette, plug it in, and it tells us what to produce, mm -hmm. right? But there's a broad range in various things. So any thoughts on uh, uh, that approach to preparedness across the broad range of, of threats that may be out there? I can start. Um, you know, so for the lens that the commission is looking at this issue, we're specifically looking at how emerging technologies are changing this landscape. Um, and we mentioned some of the potential uses of AI and biotechnology to biodefense. And you look at every uh, step in the process of responding to a threat. 
uh, and how artificial intelligence and biotech can change that landscape. Really, you know, the, the next response could be assisted or, or made better through that convergent technology. Everything from detection, we talked a little bit about biosurveillance, um, to scaling up, designing a new therapeutic or countermeasure, then scaling that up, um, being able to test that in clinical trials, uh, and then being able to distribute that effectively. All of those aspects include largest amount of data, right? And in order to sift through that data uh, and find signal and noise, Artificial intelligence, you know, is the way to do that. And so one of the thing we, lessons we've learned is how critical these tools are for us, and the mastery of them is essential to be able to be prepared for whatever we may face. And just one example, you know, because I think it helps to, to center this into something um, tangible, is researchers at Harvard Medical School and University of Oxford are using what's called a biological design tool or an AI model that's trained on biological information in this case, viral sequence and structure. And in doing so, they're able to predict the next variant that might be coming before it enters the scene. So you talk about trying to get left of boom, right? That's really exciting. You think about being able to share that information with developers of countermeasures and prepare you know, for therapeutics and vaccines before you even see something um, you know, hit, the, hit the world. So any technology that enables us to keep doing that, you know, that's exciting for me and where I think we need to focus a lot of our of our work and investments. Yeah, even if it's something uh, seen in nature, mm -hmm. that can affect right. us to be able to predict what's coming next. I, I will jump in quickly. I think I've honestly, I agree very strongly with all of that. The biggest things I think I've already touched on are one, the whole of government, whole of world response is going to be critical to how we navigate bio threats. Two, rapid integration of the private sector is the way to achieve speed. And what we've seen in a public health emergency or in a bio threat response is that speed is of the absolute essence. I'll add a third, which we haven't talked about, but I think ties to warp speed, which is I think we really revealed how critical medical supply chain and security of our medical supply chain is in our ability to effectively respond to a threat. And over the last couple of years, I think we've seen that that is not COVID specific. Mm -hmm. It includes things like the infant formula shortage that happened a couple of years ago. There have been a number of other key shortages in our ability to allocate drugs and get them to the people that need them most. And so having real federal visibility into private sector supply chains and having the levers in place to be able to augment that and increase supply of various medical countermeasures and therapeutics is extremely important in a time of peace, but in the time of war is gonna be even more important when our systems are really, really stressed. Yeah, just to your question about what did we learn from the pandemic, I'd, I'd put it sort of in the continuum of history and sort of go back to um, Senator's work and then the work that um, I did um, with um, <clears throat> the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense. The area that I focused on, just because of my government experience, was how do we get the federal government to work with other levels of government and the private sector to you know, anticipate, prepare for, respond to uh, bio threats, man-made or naturally occurring. And, um, and Shell can speak to the biodefense strategy that this administration put out back in 2022, right? Yeah, um, which is a good sort of whole of government response. But you know, our, back in 2015, we put out our first product from the bipartisan commission our focus was on uh, we need an all of government response, and it requires centralization, coordination, and leadership within any administration. And I think if you s look at the pandemic and the difficulties we had with the pandemic, you can see that as a case study in the need for that kind of centralization, akin to what we did somewhat of a lesser scale after 9-11, right? Um, the, the problem here is that this incorporates, I mean, 9-11 required actors from all over different levels of government working together in ways they hadn't before to prevent the next 9-11 and to take on the foreign terrorism threat. Here we even have a broader set of actors, public health, intelligence community, first responders. It's everybody. And so government really needs um, a centrally driven organization to make sure that that happens. You know, there are budget implications for it as well, which I know you all have addressed. Um, so that was sort of the, the initial recommendation after the pandemic, the commission came out with its Apollo recommendations for an Apollo project, which was basically to sort of do what was done and started in 1961 to get to the moon, which of course mm -hmm. then was, um, was accomplished by the end of that decade as the president requested. And so to, to look at biodefense from that perspective and to put the, the resources into it. And I think, you know, 
I think I'm seeing movement in that direction and uh, over the last couple of years since refreshing. Well, you mentioned supply chain in this conversation, and that's become a harsh reality because early on in the pandemic, when I realized that we relied uh, on a foreign adversary for, as a surgeon, protective equipment mm -hmm. and our pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. And I, said, I thought, if you'd have told me when I was in Iraq as a surgeon in the Army that my protective equipment and medications relied on an adversary, how did our military get there? How did this happen? Mm -hmm. You know, and so, but it's, but it's a threat to all of us. And so, you know, one of the things I'm working on, let's just start with our battlefield medicines and make sure that we can incentivize a way to have them 100% domestic mm -hmm. here in the United States or with our allies. That's fine. Uh, and we learned a lesson, too, with Puerto Rico as far as supply chain. Uh, Puerto Rico is large in medical manufacturing. They get two hurricanes. We can't get saline, which mm -hmm. is like water to the doctors, right? Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, we got to open our eyes to have a diverse supply chain mm -hmm. and a domestic su supply chain to, to go with it. Um, so I think we touched on some of the things that were in my questions through the answers uh, here about uh, deploying medical countermeasures, et, et, et cetera. Um, and we've talked about the United States' ability to respond, and, and I think we've had some really good suggestions here, whole of government, whole of world, or at least whole with our allies, uh, to be able to have a response. Uh, it would be a nice and ideal if the WHO uh, could function in a way that it's there to serve all of humankind and every participant was trustable and, and everything is verifiable. So I think we need to be working towards that type of, of a system some way uh, across the globe. Um, and if anybody wants to add something to that, please do. But otherwise, I'd like to start to open it up to uh, some questions, if that's good. Yeah. Go ahead. And then. Uh, this is for our professional microbiologists. <laughs> um, the application of epigenics uh, for detection, diagnosis, and then potential treatment. Sorry, I'll start again. The application of epigenics for detection, diagnosis and treatment by turning on and off uh, genomic markers. What's your assessment of the prospects there? Yeah, so um, I don't know that I can speak directly to that, but what I can say is um, we are, as I mentioned before, we are at the cusp of a lot of advances here, right? We don't understand everything we need to understand about biology. And so we, potential treatments, you know, still exist in a lot of different domains and a lot of different applications. And artificial intelligence is making that, um, it's helping us to discern and decipher through information uh, at a scale that was previously not possible. So whether it's epigenetics, whether it's mRNA technology, right, those are still on the forefront um, and new, new types of therapeutics and countermeasures are available every day. Comment and then a question. Um, acquisition always comes up in these conversations. Ooh. So the question, uh, this is the comment. Um, Acquisition always comes up in these conversations, and it's a constraint, particularly when it comes to DOD, which is only one pillar of what you are addressing. I will say that you might want to watch the Planning, Programming, Budgeting, and Execution Commission final report that's coming out on March 6th, which is giving a lot of suggestions how to be more agile in terms of making funding available, and then how to acquire much more agilely, and I think that that could be applied across the whole interagency. But the question is, um, we talked a lot about detection as part of this challenge in terms of biodefense. And I'm curious where we are relative to a national infrastructure to really detect at the human level um, any potential incoming um, biological element, where we are on that from a funding point of view, an understanding, an implementation point of view. It sounds like for you. Yeah, I can, I can definitely go first on this. Um, it's a great question and something I really want to see us invest in. I think pieces of it are there, but the integrated ecosystem is not there. So what does it look like to have a national infrastructure to be able to do something like that? One, you need collection of, and 
this must go hand in hand, securing of biological samples and genomic mm -hmm. information. I think CDC has made some strides on this with the way that the Traveler Genomic Sequencing Program works, where they're collecting wastewater off of airplanes, the National Wastewater Surveillance System, NWSS, I'm not sure what the S's are, um, does something similar around wastewater collection. But I think that is ultimately so small and so limited to seven airports and a small sampling of where we can do wastewater sequencing to be able to get that information. The second step of it is actually synthesizing that into meaningful insights and being able to then drive public health response. And I think that is where there is a huge drop off in the ability right now for us to use that information in the real day-to-day -day public health decision making that we need to be able to, not just for issuing policy guidance, but ultimately for driving medical countermeasure development or triggering allocations out of the strategic national stockpile or really being tightly tied into how our public health ecosystem operationalizes that information. And so I think what this is going to require is a much more comprehensive approach across the intel agencies, the CDC and the public health agencies who do have a lot of expertise in the scientific components of this, but not necessarily in the operational components of it, and the State Department and our ability to gather sort of you know foreign intelligence on this. Um, I think this is something I would actually be really curious for your thoughts on, which is where that leadership is going to have to come from outside of the individual agencies to drive that level of coordination and orchestrated funding across these agencies. I think the potential is there. I think the private sector has the technology, but actually piecing that together is something uniquely the government is empowered to do, yeah. and I really want to see us get there. Yeah, I, I, just to add a little bit, I know it's something that we're still discussing of where the right leadership is, but I think you're right, and, and this has been touched on before, the number of stakeholders in this issue area is so large, it spreads across so many federal agencies, that having a centralized authority or, or someone overseeing all of this, a point person, if you will, um, is, is critically important. So where that is and how that looks, we're still under discussion, but it is something you know we're critically aware of and we're, we're looking further up. Can I, yeah, yeah, please. This is at heart, as you know very well, it's, it's a political problem, not in the sense of politics, electoral politics, but in the sense that, you know, our government is obviously very big, and the only, those who've worked in the executive branch know this, the only centralizing node in the executive branch is the office of the presidency. And their bandwidth is simply not big enough. It's the only office that all the agencies respond to is the president, because he or she's the chief executive, right? So, the, so what, what has to happen is we have to develop workarounds that are able to sort of simulate that or create interagency uh, coordination. And it's very difficult because in Washington, the people with the power are the people who control budgets and personnel. And the, those are agency heads. So you can create a czar if you want. How many presidents have created czars over something? But they don't have any authority over personnel. They don't have any authority uh, over budgets. And so their authority is only insofar as the president backs them up, right? And after a while. So this is very difficult. And it's, I do think, though, we have some models out there. Like, um, and, and, the, and, and uh, Bob Work and I recommended this in the NSIB report. CFIUS works pretty well, uh -huh. mm. right? And so. That's if you can get the principles, the statutory principles or deputies involved and raise the priority of it, you may be able to work the way around it. The other issue, which I think you raised, Hurst, which I don't know what to do about, is for the government to make all these decisions, it has to itself have the necessary expertise. Yeah. And this is very, we don't have, that's not resident in, in these agencies, I mean, just in the intel, what yeah. you, what, what, you know, you, you've got intel people that not necessarily AI experts, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to, to accumulate that kind of expertise. So, Senator, just two fingers on that, because it's something that we're looking deeply at the commission. One of our areas of focus is what we're calling bioliteracy. And so how do you improve the understanding of not only the general public, but also of our our policymakers uh, in biotechnology and in associated technologies. So this is something that we're thinking very deeply about. We understand you know, that what you just described, right? It, it makes it very difficult to grapple with these issues um, without that expertise. And so we're looking at things like boot camps, you know, that bring some of this technology um, to our policymakers and how that could be operationalized. Just to highlight what the senator mentioned about um, 
the reality that the one coordinating mechanism within the government is the Office of the Presidency, and you've got the interagency process, and there is a bandwidth issue there. But that is very, that's a very real concern when you're trying to pull together agencies that have disparate missions and get them to focus on one mission and focus them, their resources and their people on one mission. And in fact, when we wrestled with this issue in the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense, we came up with a proposal that it actually the, that authority reside in the office of the Vice President. And there are a lot of practical problems with that. But part of the reasoning behind that recommendation was just to highlight that issue. That this is the only place where if you have something of absolutely enormous national significance, you're really going to be able to corral all the federal players and move them with expedition you know, in the direction of your objective. And you need that, plus maybe a coordinating council or what have you, maybe some sort of CFIUS idea. But that is, I know that there's a lot of thought about how best to, to create that kind of mechanism, mm -hmm. but not at the same time plant it right in the middle of the White House that has a few other things on its plate. I, and I will say, you know, within the agencies or looking at the agencies, looking at congressional committees, everyone's kind of siloed. Mm -hmm. And and that is one of the biggest mm -hmm. problems. And as we're going through this pandemic committee, you know, we're reaching out to this agency, that agency, that agency, and, you know, kind of realizing that if more of you were in the same room at the same time, we, we might do a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, and I would... A takeaway, lessons learned, you know, that this was very novel. But it seemed to me at the White House, we needed more people around the table for the daily conversations, I thought. But again, lesson learned, and I'm not trying to be uh, critical uh, because this was unique uh, to us. So we can, we can have a lesson learned there. More questions? Yeah. Hi, uh, Brennan Bordelon. I'm a tech policy reporter with Politico. Um, I'm pretty sure you know everybody on this panel here. Um, I think Michelle, maybe in particular, talked about the importance of you know making sure that the U.S. biotechnology space continues to lead the world. Uh, China, in particular, being a concern there. Um, I've heard from some biosecurity researchers though that some of the recent U.S. government efforts to crack down or otherwise sort of make it you know make clear that or make sure I guess that AI and biosecurity don't become sort of a merged threat could maybe make it harder to lead in the biotechnology space. So I'm thinking in particular of the AI executive order, some of the, um, the gene sequence screening uh, mechanisms in there. And uh, I've heard from some researchers who say, listen, like we've got enough paperwork to do. We've got a ton of like, you know, basic security things we have to fill out. Now we're gonna have to go through this new system for every piece of DNA that we order. It's just not tenable. It's gonna bring us behind the Chinese potentially in this space. What's your response to that? And, and I guess, you know, for, this for anybody. Um, inherent in that question is sort of a broader concern that you hear amongst a lot of biotechnology people that um, this focus on the existential risks inherent in AI and biotechnology are a little speculative. Um, there's a lot of money, uh, particularly from Silicon Valley, being put into this research, but there's not a lot of actual um, real world evidence so far to indicate that AI is going to supercharge these, biotech or, you know, these biosecurity threats. And they're a little worried that, you know, as things like this EO come out, uh, it's going to make it harder and harder for them to actually do research that is grounded in real empirical data. So, you know, specific responses so far with the EO, concerns about that, maybe slowing down biotechnology research, and then the broader concern, if you could speak to that, anybody, about some of the, uh, I think, uh, issues with potentially focusing on existential risk of AI and biosecurity with um, what I've heard is pretty light evidence so far in terms of, of how these things play out, particularly with LLMs. Yeah, I can definitely start with that. So this is something that we're looking closely at the commission is the intersection of AI and bio and what policy recommendations we could put forward to address the risks we see. Um, a couple things, you know, to, to state in framing this discussion. The first is, you know, from my perspective, there are two outcomes that are that are problematic. One is we don't act, right? We don't mitigate the risk that exists in the potential uh, future for AI and biotechnology to lower the barrier to creation of a bioweapon. The, the other scenario is that we overact and that we restrict the ability to use these tools, and we've talked about the potential applications of AI biotech for a number of, of domains, but particularly for pandemic preparedness. If we somehow limit our ability to progress in the, the advances uh, in the models, in the, in the associated data, if we lose out at the leading edge to our strategic competitors, you know, that is also a risk of which we must, we must be mindful. And so we are looking at recommendations at the commission that would balance mitigating the risk and also ensuring that 
you know, the, those that are trying to use the tools for beneficial uses are able to do that. Um, and would love to continue that conversation with folks as we, you know, test out different policy proposals there on the tools themselves. So we're also looking and understand that the risk is not uniform across AI tools, right? And so policy approaches cannot be a one size fits all. Most of the discussion has been around large language models like ChatGPT, which are trained by and large today on existing information from the internet. So it's unlikely, and we, have, we haven't seen yet, that these tools are actually providing information that creates something that we've never seen before, right? The unknown that would evade detection, evade attribution, the things that, you know, if we should be really scared about. That doesn't exist with the LLMs as they stand today, again, from what we've seen. Now, they could make it easier to, for someone to get access to information, to lower the barrier, right, by compiling something and presenting it to someone. And we should be mindful of that risk and guard against that. But that future scenario of this unknown, you know, I think the good news is, is that there's still time to act and to put some of those guardrails in place, being mindful of that balance so that we can leverage the tools for our own preparedness, for our own economic benefit, but guard against, you know, that future outcome that I think we, sh you know, we need to prevent against. To what extent do you think it would be possible, and maybe you're doing this already, maybe the, to, to get uh, groups of people together from the industry sectors and get them to tell you what the best practices are and what the best yeah. practices are? You're probably way ahead of doing that. Right? <laughs> we, are, we are definitely doing that. We're talking to a lot of leading companies in this field and, and academics um, to understand you know, what they intend to use the tools for. Mm -hmm. what, what, you know, we have researchers and companies that are that are using not LLMs particularly, but what we call biodesign tools. So AI models that are trained not on natural language or things on the internet, but on biological information, so things like DNA. And they're doing this in order to be able to design new vaccines, new therapeutics, right, to make sense of biology, which we said before, still very complex. Um, so lots of beneficial uses here, but also the potential, you know, that someone could misuse this information. So we're talking to a lot of them to understand what the leading edge is, what they are trying to achieve, and potential guardrails that wouldn't impact their ability to achieve those outcomes, but would guard against someone misusing, you know, that, those data sets. I wonder if the nuclear enterprise might be a model, because that's been around a long time, yes. and uh, there is a security consciousness yeah. within that community. Uh, and they've worked their way into it so that it really doesn't obstruct. Now, obviously, it's a very diff difficult sure. sort of field, but I wonder if that wouldn't be a model. Yeah, we're looking, we, are, we have looked at nuclear, we're looking at cybersecurity yeah. as well. You know, look at, you know, a domain, digital domain, where there's a lot of civilian and commercial uses, but there's also the potential, you know, for, for weaponization of that technology. So I think there are good practices from other sectors that we can put into play here. Um, and again, it's just achieving that balance in my mind. One of the comments I made to Ken before we came out here is that you always have to be um, wary of the bad actors, right? Uh, I said the Wright brothers, I'm sure, were not anticipating that their invention could be used to fly into buildings and kill 3,000 people in one day. And that's what we have to be thinking forward about and how do we protect ourselves uh, from that. Yes? That's you. That's why I was Yes. Hi, so nice to see so many of you. Emily Kleiss from Ginkgo Bioworks, uh, previously from Senate Intel. So thank you so much to my former sister committee for hosting this and bringing some of these important issues into the light. I am delighted to listen to you all because the entire reason I left government for this technology specifically was because I think it's the one that we must be at, at leading at the critical edge for. So Michelle, thank you for your comments. My question is short. When do you think that chat GPT moment for bio is going to happen in a matter of time? <laughs> it's a great question. I think if we predict that, you know, lots of things become possible. I don't have a specific answer for you, but maybe for this audience and, and for, for the committee, one thing we have to understand, and I don't think we know with as much granularity, is where we are in progression towards that moment vis-a-vis -vis our strategic competitors. And so understanding where we stand, where, you know, where China stands, in much more detail so that we can calibrate policy options to make sure that we maintain at the leading edge. That's critically important, um, and we don't understand that with enough granularity today. That, that relies on open source information, a better understanding of science and tech landscapes, OSINT, if you will, um, and you know we just have to get better at that. Yeah, I think slightly different approach to that question is that part of what made the ChatGPT moment so 
universal was that there was something so legible to every person in the world, which was a chat interface with which to interact with AI. Generative language models have existed for, you know, at least five plus years, but that moment of it being so in your face and I think visible and visceral to everyone, what it looked like to interact with AI was in some ways helpful because it helped popularize the risks that were, that were posed. I actually fear that we won't have a similar moment with biology because it'll never be something that every American or every person wants to think about every day. And mm. so putting the systems in place now is so critical because that moment will be much more gradual and will hit the breaking point of threat in a way that then becomes a concern to everyone but won't be a chat interface through which we interact with AI. I think we have time for one more question. You've had your hand up a while, sorry. To expand on this idea of infrastructure, I mean, we talked about identification discovery, but I think one of the big things is also our ability to produce, right, production. Um, we're in the semiconductor industry, and now we're in the middle of that with CHIPS, the CHIPS Act, right? We're trying to actually make up for the inability for us to domestically produce a critical technology. Um, and, I, and, you know, here in the discussion, it seems like we, we, are, we are kind of already thinking about this now, but uh, how, do we, how do we make sure that our U.S. domestic bomb manufacturing infrastructure is there so that we don't need a chips for BioAct 10 years from now, right? And that we're not making decisions of, do we fund old, you know, state of the past technology, but we're actually funding state of the future type technologies. Look, can I take a stab at that? <laughs> <laughs> because uh, you, you talk about the CHIPS Act. I really wanted the CHIPS Act to be uh, more broad as far as implementation for whatever national security risk we identify as opposed to the one that was very specific. So that if we identify that as a nation and Congress and the White House agree, then we go ahead with, with a plan to, to do that. And, and I think that's something that we should still take a look at uh, to address that so that we're not behind the curve and waiting for it, but all we have to do is agree that this is a risk mm -hmm. and we've got to get moving on it. Yeah. Maybe we do have time for your one more question back there. Public health threats. Um, going to that broader kind of question, and, and I think this panel identifies the, the breadth of different actors and players are in here from across the board. But what we've seen historically is that we've gone from crisis to complacency over the years in, in terms of political will, right? We have something happen, we throw lots of money at it in an emergency supplemental much of which is Band-Aid, and then we forget about it in very short order of time, or we reallocate it, right? My company was involved in Ebola. We went from Ebola, stop Ebola, go to Zika. Stop Zika, go to this. And there isn't a level of sustainability that allows for both the development, the discovery, the procurement, the stockpiling that's needed to have these responses ready to go before the event happens. So how do we break that and provide sustainability across the enterprises that is needed for that public-private partnership? Boy, that's a big problem. <laughs> I used to, because I've done a lot of work in the defense area, and our, our response in the, in, the, in the area of the armed services is, uh, well, well, we'll wait until there's a threat that's so big that we have to deal with it or that we get mad and then we build up real quickly and beat the crap out of it and then we go back down again. And it's not going to work with us. I actually have a suggestion and I wonder if the congressman thinks this, that it would work. So if you look at the chain of pandemic resilience, there, there's like de de detection, attribution, communication, medical, man medical countermeasure stockpiling, medical countermeasure distribution, which we haven't talked about. Yeah. I think AI has a lot to do there. And then medical management. So there's links in it. And suppose the speaker and the, and, and the leader, the matter whether, whoever, whichever party controlled, told the authorizing committees, look, uh, we want you, in the areas where you have jurisdiction over these different links, we want you to make it a priority, the chairman and the ranking member, to achieve progress this year, okay? By the end of this year, we want you to have passed things or funded things or held hearings that have made progress, and you're gonna report back to us. 
And by the way, if, you're, if you'd like to be a chairman or a ranking member, you need to learn something about this whole bio-preparation issue. And maybe we're going to grade the committees. So, I mean, I was a committee chairman. I mean, you know, if you get tasked with this, this is the way I think to energize staff, et cetera. And that will then force the committees uh, to reach out to the commissions, mm -hmm. okay? What are your recommendations? We need, we, need, we need ideas in these areas. So something like that where, where top leadership can institutionalize this as a priority among the people who matter. And of course, it would have to be done with the appropriators as well. Now, whether you can tell the appropriators to do anything <laughs> is a very open question. But I think, you know, if, if we need to think in those ideas, what can we do that alters incentives so we automatically, we institutionalize and regularize priorities in this area? It might work. I don't know. Well, my feeling on all of this is this should not be a partisan issue anyway. No, I, so. and, and that's one bullet I think we've largely dodged with this. I don't think it's... It's very partisan. So listen, I want to thank everybody for coming. I, I'm going to tell you, um, we're going to play this back a few times because I think we got a lot out of today. Uh, talking about the lessons learned, path forward, uh, the things we still don't know and don't know necessarily what the best solutions are, but continue to work on those. And uh, I think my takeaway, which has, has been all along is important for Congress to work with the leading experts out in the field, whether they're government experts or private sector experts. Uh, it's the combination of the two that are only going to advance us. Uh, we're just at a different time to where we can rely on the government to create the newest technology. Yep. It's all out there. So we, we need to work together, work with our allies, work with our partners. Uh, counter adversarial threats mm -hmm. as we see them developing. Be ahead of the game. And as the uh, mantra of the Reagan Institute is peace through strength, we've got to be strong. Mm -hmm. We've got to be stronger than the other person. And we have to be able to defend ourselves. And you, it was mentioned nuclear, the nuclear model. Well, the nuclear model as far as war is, we got to have it too. And we got to have just as many as you. Uh, and that's the deterrence. So th those are all the things that we need to consider. Um, the other thing is there's just so many positives that can come out of the work uh, related to this that have no nefarious behavior behind it. So I want to thank the panelists uh, for being here today. I thought it was a great group, and I hope that you all agree. I want to thank the Ronald Reagan Institute for having us today. And uh, I hope we get a lot of hits on this, people uh, watching here today, <laughs> including members of Congress, by the way. So, uh, but I look forward to continuing this conversation. So thank you all very much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you.